Hello zusammen and welcome back to the channel. I don't think I'm giving you any earth shattering news when I tell you that shows like CSI, NCIS, Law and Order, these shows try to wrap up cases in 45 minutes of real air time, but within an hour. And they try to make everything look so cut and dry, neat and clean, and that's just the way criminal cases are. The truth is, that's not the way criminal cases are. Very, very few cases are really obvious. I mention that because one of the most important cases that has ever come out in the United States concerning criminal law is the case of Adam Walsh, a seven-year-old who was kidnapped and murdered. I'm going to go into detail. I'm going to go into great detail about this case in just a moment. But the reason this case is so important is because this case, unlike any other, had a massive impact on criminal justice in the United States and ultimately led to the founding of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and also went on to nationalize sex offender registries. So this case is huge, but this case is not what you think it was or is. There is a whole lot more to this case and we're gonna dive into it in just a moment. I'm gonna say one more thing before we get started and that is the father of Adam Walsh, John Walsh, became a multimillionaire based on child advocacy and pushing sex offender registry laws and whatnot. We're talking today only about Adam Walsh, the case. We'll talk about John Walsh in the next video. So let's get started in this one. In order to best understand this case, probably the best thing that we can do is to go through the timeline as best we understand it for that day. Now, the day we're talking about, of course, is July 27th, 1981. According to Adam's mother, she went to the school at around 12 o'clock that day, the school where her son attended, and went inside that school with her son in order to pay the tuition. After finishing paying the tuition, she took Adam to the Sears Shopping Center in Hollywood, where she wanted to look for a lamp in the home furnishings department. Now, of course, what seven-year-old wants to go shopping in the home furnishings department? So he asked if he could stay in the toy department, and she said, yeah because there were two young black boys there and two young white boys in the toy department playing with the latest Atari 2600. And she thought, well, you know, there's other kids there, he can play the video game. Now, if she left the school at 12, we're talking about maybe 12, 15, they arrive at Sears, she goes shopping. At approximately 1245, she comes back to the toy department and she can't find her son anywhere. In fact, none of the children are there. So she went to the service center and asked that he be paged. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, they paged Adam repeatedly and searched the store but could not find him. At that point, this would be 1 p.m., they call the police. Simultaneously, the mother leaves this, the Sears store and goes into the mall proper, you know, where the other stores are at, and she starts searching for her son there in the event that he would have wandered out of Sears. Now, it's important to point out that both Adam's teacher and his mother both said that he wasn't the type to just wander off like that. He, he wasn't one who would just open up to strangers and talk to them. So for him to have just wandered out on his own would have been unusual. Later, we learned that according to the teenage security guard who was working Sears that day at the computer, you know, the video game computer, the two black boys and the two white boys got into an argument, might have turned into a fight. So they were kicked out of the store. The two black boys were sent out one exit. The two white boys were sent out another exit. They continue to page Adam from 1 p.m. until 5 p.m. when the store starts closing, but they also started searching the parking lot, of course, and, and started searching around. Unfortunately, there would be no trace of Adam for several weeks.
Approximately two weeks later, two fishermen in northern Florida, far away from Hollywood, much closer to Jacksonville. I'm going to put a, a map up on the screen so that you can see it. These two fishermen found what they thought was a baby doll head floating in the water. But when they got closer, they saw that, in fact, it was a child's head. They, of course, informed the police. The police recovered the, the head. The head was turned over to the medical examiner. They searched the immediate area around where the head was found, but they never did find the body. And unfortunately, that's where the case lay for the, for the next two years. On October 10th, 1983, a made-for-TV movie was broadcast, and it was titled Adam. This made-for-TV movie explained the entire case of Adam and everything that they knew about the case up to that point. Every, I don't, I don't know that it was every detail, but it was a, a, a great amount of detail. 11 days later, on October 21st, 1983, a man by the name of Otis Toole came forward and admitted to being the man who kidnapped and murdered Adam Walsh. One of the first problems I have with this case is when the police went and interviewed the secretary in the school where the mother went and paid Adam's tuition. The secretary test, or when I say testified, gave a statement to the police saying that when the mother came that morning to pay the tuition, it was not at 12 o'clock like the mother claimed, it was more like 1030. And that when she came into the school to pay the tuition, Adam was not with her. She said that she could see that he wasn't in the car. She was not, he was not in the, the school office with her. She did not see Adam at all. And again, it was an hour and a half earlier than the mother testified. That's odd because if Adam wasn't there, and in fact, we don't have much evidence that Adam was actually in the store. Could it be that Adam was missing far longer or far earlier than what we were led to believe? Another interesting aspect is when when they interviewed the security guard that threw the boys out of the uh, store for arguing over the, the computer, she said that she didn't remember Adam at all. And they showed her a photograph of Adam and she could not identify him. At that time, back in those days, there was no security camera footage. And so there's no way to actually say what happened to Adam. Did he leave with the group? Did he wander off by himself? Was he lured by an adult out of the store? We don't know. So let's talk about Otis Toole. The fact that he waited until after he saw this film in order to confess should cause us some concern. When he spoke to the police and they asked him about, can you please identify what Adam was wearing? What did he look like? He identified Adam as having blonde curly hair. He identified Adam as wearing dungarees. He identified Adam as wearing sneakers. In fact, Adam had straight brown hair, was wearing green shorts, and was wearing flip-flops, not sneakers. But somehow the, belie the police believed initially that Otis was credible as the killer. According to his initial statement, Otis claimed that he, when he was driving through the parking lot of Sears in a white four-door Cadillac, not a blue van, he lured the boy into the car with promises of candy. Now this is a little odd considering that Everyone testified that Adam was shy and would, would not necessarily have spoken to strangers. This boy had just been kicked out of a store, was separated from his mother, and you would think he'd be more concerned with getting reunited with his mother instead of climbing in a car with someone on promises of candy. Just doesn't make sense. So anyways, to continue with Otis's statement, after he kidnapped the boy, he was driving back toward Jacksonville, Florida, when the kid started crying and, and whining. and. Otis started getting frustrated with the kid and started punching him in the head with a closed fist. That only made the kid start sobbing worse. And so he eventually pulled off the side of the road and choked Adam to death, according to Otis's statement, with a seatbelt. At that point, Otis's longtime boyfriend, Henry Ray Lucas, pulled out a machete and cut the boy's head off. They threw the boy's head in a canal and buried the body somewhere. It was only after the police investigated his claims that they said, hey, Otis, can you show us where the body is located? In order to make sure he had a good idea, they act, the police actually showed photographs to Otis ahead of time. So, of course, he knew where the area was. 
And he, he could identify it when the police drove up there. Now, when he got there to the place where the head was located, he claimed to have buried the body in a particular place. For the next few days, the police dug up the area and found no body. Further, they brought in cadaver dogs, found no body. They brought in ground sonar, found no body. The other thing that really concerned police later was that the supposed long-term boyfriend that cut the head off was actually serving time in prison in Virginia at the time. And it was absolutely impossible that the boyfriend participated in the kidnapping and the murder. Therefore, his whole statement was incredulous. Nonetheless, the police gave him an opportunity to provide a second statement. So what they did is they drove him to Sears and he said when he got there, oh, this doesn't look like the right Sears. They said, oh, that's great because that was a test. They took him out to lunch brought him back an hour later and said, is this the Sears? And he said, yes, this is definitely the one. But it was the same Sears. So clearly the police were leading him to a particular statement. Now, after his first statement fell apart, he now claimed that he had cut Adam's head off in the back of the car, kept the head in the, the footwell of the back seat, and then burned the body, incinerated it inside of an ice box. He initially said that the Machete was sold in a uh, flea market at a swap meet, but later the police were actually able to recover the car. They recovered the machete. They recovered the floor mat in the back of the car where supposedly Adam's head was cut off. Interesting thing is when they sprayed the floor mats with luminol, they did find traces of something. Now I have since learned that blood is not the only thing that luminol will show. It'll also show bleach and, and other products. So it was only an indicator that there was something. Here's the crazy part. During the investigation, the police managed to lose the machete before blood testing could be done. They managed to lose the floor mat before the blood testing could be done. And they managed to lose the car. How do you lose an entire car? So what you have is the very unreliable statement of Otis Tool and evidence that has been lost. Now, I find that to be a considerable, considerable problem in this case, keeping in mind what I said earlier, where the dental records were actually never consulted for this child. So we don't even know that that was Adam's head. We never found a body. Now, let me put this all into perspective. In conclusion, I'm going to say what I think should be obvious to everybody at this point. Otis Tool did not kidnap or kill Adam Walsh. There just really is no substantial evidence to support that. Now, I think it's really interesting that 10 years after Tool died is when Adam Walsh and the police department closed the file and officially named him as the killer. How convenient. I mean, really. I can understand why, they, why everybody wanted the case closed, however, because there was such an embarrassment to this investigation. I mean, how the hell do you lose a car? How do you lose a bloody floor mat? Uh, floor mat? How do you lose a bloody machete that supposedly chopped a child's head off? How do you not write an autopsy report? And I'll tell you why. Because if Otis Toole had been named as the defendant and dragged into court, any half-decent defense attorney would have shredded that case. And it would have been crystal clear to the entire world that the, not only did the police screw up, but that the real killer was out there somewhere. So I just really, uh, that irks me. Now, why did Adam, or excuse me, why did John Walsh want the case closed? Well, quite frankly, he had built a career for himself. He became a co-founder of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. He went on to host a multi-million dollar I don't know how many years long it ran television program, America's Most Wanted. And today he's worth tens of millions of dollars, all because of his advocacy based on his son being kidnapped and murdered. By the way, we don't even know if he was murdered. Keep that in mind. There's no definitive proof that the skull found was Adams. But let's go beyond that a bit. Not only did they use this kidnapping and murder to launch a political career and a public image career of John Walsh, but they used this to create the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act, which was used to nationalize sex offender registries across the entire country. Now, you have to ask yourself, why sex offender registries? What in the world do, do sex offenders have to do with this case? Because while we know he was kidnapped or went missing, 
presumably he was murdered at some point. There is zero evidence that he was sexually assaulted. There's no evidence whatsoever of it. And yet that's what everybody talks about whenever we talk about the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act. I think it's just absurd. I think this is one more example of when somebody takes a horrific case and uses it to launch a political career or to score political points or to create a multi-million dollar empire on television. It's just pathetic. And I think it's pathetic how these politicians are using this to, to push down other people's human rights. You may not like what convicted sex offenders have done, and I think virtually all of us would, would condemn those acts. But to strip someone for their, of their human rights based on a lie, I can't go for it. So I hope you found this entertaining to some degree, and I hope you found it informative, and I hope it really got you to think about some things. So until next time, when we will be talking about John Walsh himself, I wish you safety and health. Cheers.